So hi, I'm Mark. Um, I, I work at Shazam um, here in London, um, and I thought I'd talk to you talk to you today for a little bit about uh, longevity. Um, and really, the reason uh, I wanted to talk about this today was that, um, well, the inspiration was that we had a sort of joking conversation the other day in the office about um, a particular project that has been in development for about two years, and it's one of our sort of core metadata systems at Shazam. And um, someone suggested, well, what would happen if the, if the engineering team that were working on that project, what if they were to disappear overnight? And uh, it's a Scala project, and uh, use Akka. This, I'm not in that team, um, it's, but it's Scala and Akka, and uh, it's a lot of the tech that I and my team <coughs> tend to use. Um, and uh, would, would, you, would you take on that project? Um, and uh, I've, I've had some dealings with that project. I've uh, seen some of the code. I've, chatted to a lot of the guys, uh, it's actually an offshore team that work on it. I've chatted to a lot of them about it and um, uh, and actually my answer was probably no. I don't think I'd want to take that on. Um, and it's kind of, this is a, a theme I think, uh, I, not just at Shazam but across the industry, um, where I found that, um, well, it, well to be honest, that the system I'm talking about, if we, if we uh, were to rewrite it again, that would be about the fifth rewrite of something very, very similar. Um, and so, you know, the, all these rewrites are very, very costly, and uh, it sort of feels like maybe we're not quite doing something right. Um, so I want to explore that theme, really. And I have a little bit of a confession to make, actually, uh, which is that um, I, I, I originally sort of started writing up some of this material, and then the opportunity to speak today came along. Um, and I thought I could adapt it to being a lot, about, a lot of this to be being about Scala, but I think I'm really just talking generally about engineering uh, today, but but I've been working with Scala for six years now. I'm wearing a Scala T-shirt, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I I know a little bit. Um, so uh, but yeah, this is this is fa fairly broad, uh, not particularly no, no monads here. Sorry if you if you're hoping for monads. Um, so uh, yeah, so I thought I might just try and uh, discuss some of the. Uh, some of the things I've seen in the wild, um, these are mostly Shazam examples um, of uh, systems that, uh, that, that I've, I've seen and worked on. Um, you've probably, a lot of you have probably seen one of these. Um, so we, we have, or actually had, past tense, uh, a, a monolithic Java app that uh, handled a graph of <laughs> metadata that was, had like a billion uh, nodes of metadata in it. Um, and yeah, so... Uh, it's, it, it's now defunct. Uh, well, actually, there's still a little bit of it running. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it lived a reasonable life, um, but we decided to rewrite it. Um, and uh, you know, why, why, did, why did we, why did we re rewrite it? Um, this, is, this is another, oh yeah, sorry for the, uh, the, the, sort of the, the, the template I'm using here with all these random uh, images in the background. This is the Shazam template. I just thought it fit somehow. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, this is another example. This is, I don't think this code still runs in production. I, I thought, didn't think to check. Um, but we did have for a long while running in Shazam, uh, like when you Shazam a song, that's a heavily concurrent uh, operation. There's a, like it's a, a fork join of massive scale just to do one Shazam. Uh, and right at the heart of that was a, was a PHP script that uh, our former CTO, uh, he's not here today, our former CTO <laughs> had written uh, very hastily. I, I believe the, the stories, he wrote it over the course of a weekend. And this, this lived at the heart of Shazam for quite a few years. Um, let's say good, maybe five years. Um, and uh, it certainly had longevity, that's for sure. Um, quality, maybe not. Um, so, uh, and this, this is another example. So this was... Um, a project in a previous company where I was asked to um, actually take on this project because um, uh, the, the engineer was a bit of a, an information silo. He, he left the company and kind of left this, this project. And it was sort of almost finished, uh, not yet deployed to production. And he'd written this um, Scala app using Acker STM, which is, which is now deprecated. It's a software transactional memory. And it sounded all very exciting at the time. Um, but I mean, the the question really was, why was it using STM? Um, and, uh, and actually, um, on taking on the project and rewriting it, um, I discovered there was absolutely no reason to use transactional memory at all. It was just uh, the developer in question just wanted to try something new, right? So, um, but that, that incurred another rewrite. So, great. Um, so, 
So were these systems built for longevity? Was, was longevity in the minds of the engineers at the time when they actually, well, yeah, as a team, um, in most cases, sat, sat down and wrote these, wrote, built these systems? Um, you know, you take the, the PHP script as an example. I mean, absolutely not. It was the last thing in our CTO's mind. Uh, it was he wanted to get the job done, write a, a little bit of PHP. He knew it was a few lines of PHP, probably about this much PHP, but um, he wasn't thinking about longevity. And, and the, the guy who decided to use Acker STM, he, he wasn't thinking about longevity. He just wanted to try out something new, right? And well, the monolithic Java application, may, maybe, maybe we were thinking about longevity there, maybe. Um, but its, it's life uh, was, I think, cut short, and I want to try and explore why that, why that was. Um, and another aspect, of course, is not just how you build it, it's how you, how you maintain it. And, you know, were we, uh, in, in, in Shazam's case, are we uh, neglecting our systems, maybe? Uh, you know, are we, are we sufficiently maintaining our systems such that they can live a longer life and we can avoid rewrites? Um, just to get a show of hands, does everybody in the room have experience of rewrites of systems? Is this a common thing? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, cool, it's not just me, good. All right, okay, let's, let's move on. Um, so it's not just Shazam. Um, right, so, um, so yeah, I just wanted to explore a little bit, so uh, why systems fail. And so, like, if we are talking about rewrites, um, Maybe, you know, maybe the first bullet point here is a failure of different kind. It's systems sometimes fail because of external factors and they don't need rewriting, they just need to be binned. Um, so maybe the contract failed or maybe it, it expired and they didn't renew or um, you know, maybe the, t the, the team that was working on that thing moved on and the company decided they weren't, maybe the company pivoted, maybe they didn't want to uh, work on that particular thing anymore. They removed that feature from the app or whatever it is. Um, so we can't really do a lot about those, as engineers anyway, we can't do a lot about those external factors. So I won't try and cover much of that in this, this presentation. I, I would say that the, the last two points here, we do have quite a bit of control over though. Um, and so uh, poor design and poor execution. Um, I've, I've seen examples of systems failing. Um, certainly you know, on the design front, you know, uh, if you, you don't, maybe haven't considered scale, you haven't considered failure scenarios, you've not considered um, you know, how, how the, the system will integrate with other systems, how it will live in the real world, and poor design can really hurt there. Um, and, and execution, well, execution's a difficult one that, that covers so much, but, and that, but there's, there's, there's also, there's plenty of, this is just good software engineering, right? There's plenty of uh, material, there's plenty of uh, uh, how-to guides, I don't know. We, we all know as an, we're all growing as an industry to try and get better at design and execution. And I think that one thing we're not doing a lot of really talking, particularly not talking about and doing that much is, is maintenance. And I think, you know, in my experience, I'm often, the maintainer of a system, um, but I'm not actually actively developing a system. And so, um, you know, I'll be labeled as a maintainer and certainly in the open source community we have maintainers. And I think open source maintainers actually, you know, raise up to the, or, you know, live up to the name even. They, they do maintain their systems, but do we actually maintain our systems or do we just dive in when something goes wrong and, and uh, try not to touch as, as uh, you know, trying to minimize the collateral damage and get out of there as quickly as possible. So. Um, so I want to look at yeah these, these two things, uh, design and execution to some extent, but also I really want to explore maintenance today, I think. Um, and should you care? Um, so, you know, really, do we care about longevity? Should we just actually just uh, build it and hope that it runs for a year or so and just forget about it and, uh, you know, it'll get replaced at some point? Should, should we care? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, should we? I mean, rewrites are expensive. Um, but maintaining legacy is probably more expensive, so uh, so should we care? I mean, so this is rather abstract, but um, you know, I think the ideal system, maybe like I'd say, like this, this if, imagine this is the Linux kernel, say, um, it's been maintained for decades, and uh, the, the the programming language that's that's built in is still relevant today, or at least probably the best language for for the kernel to be written in, um, and it's been well maintained by a very knowledgeable and talented group of engineers uh, over the years and it's probably just as fresh today to work on maybe I don't know I don't actually not a kernel, kernel maintainer that's for sure but I imagine it's, it's relatively fresh to work on there's certainly aspects of the kernel that have been rewritten over the years um, so that's probably the best we can aim for the you know that the language is still relevant and we've maintained it over the years um, then there are these systems and like I would say our um, our monolithic Java application is a great example of this, where over time we're still running the thing, but 
we've never really uh, maintained or brought it up to current standards. Um, we've never uh, we've never really touched it. Besides, we've never really uh, taken it down for maintenance and really tried to bring it back up, it looking looking fresh. We've just we just kept it running. Um, and and so I think that, that this category of thing is is something we can do something about. I think we can try and get these these old systems, <coughs> try and make, bring them closer to this this line here. Maybe we should we should think about that. Um, and then there's the systems uh, that like the the Acker STM one, I think, which probably um, die very quickly, and and uh, we you know probably shouldn't maintain them. We should let them die. Um, but um, where was I going there? But uh, well. I think we should probably aim. We should aim for this, uh, and try and bring this up here. And well, but also think about well, we should. Well, what I'm trying to say, yes, we should let it die if it should die. And uh, and uh, we certainly have some category, some examples there. Uh, I'll move on. Okay. Um, uh, right. So there's just a couple of observations. One is that longevity is not a function of size. A small PHP script can live for a long time if you're not careful, and can be very hard to replace. A little script. Uh, similarly, longevity is not a function of quality. Uh, a small PHP script can live for a long time, um, and uh, no matter how poor it is. Um, uh, yes, so two different elephants there. Um, and I think that, you know, the, as engineers, the early decisions we make in a project's life um, have a great effect on, on the longevity. So. That's the choice of language, the choice of framework, the choice of databases, the, 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 the design of the system as a whole. I mean, you can, if you have the right design, you can maintain your way out of some in implementation flaws. But, you know, con con conversely to that, if, you, if you're building in the wrong direction, you, you're never going get, to get it back on the, on the, the straight and narrow. So, um, and, um, well, just, uh, yeah, one thing I think that's quite a promising development, actually, is that, uh, you know, we are now, it seems, moving towards more micro-architectures and micro-services and uh, micro-repos and, well, actually, maybe that's an anti-pattern. But I, I think that micro-architectures make maintenance possible um, because, I mean, this is a biological example, but you can, you can compart if, by compartmentalizing different aspects of the system, uh, we can maintain different areas in, in isolation. Um, I would argue that, yeah, micro-architectures make that possible but in my experience, we're not really doing the maintenance. We know we can maintain. Um, and sure, we, we sometimes leverage the fact that a microarchitecture you can, allows us to replace a system, re, you know, rewrite. Um, but uh, we're not really making use of the fact that we have a small component. We can, we can bring it up to scratch. It's probably, it's fairly self-contained. We know the interfaces now. We, can, we could actually, it, you know, maybe not rewrite. Maybe we can just sort of nudge it in the right direction. Um, you know, give it another lease of life. Um, so, so I guess my sort of central idea here, besides, besides getting the design right and getting the, you know, getting the early ideas right, is um, this is something I've been doing for the, over the years. I never really thought uh, ab about it. I never really gave a name to it. I never thought, sort of formalized it in any way. Never, I never made it onto my Kanban board, but it was something uh, that, I, that I've certainly been practicing, and that is just uh, regular servicing. Of, of, your, of your components. So, I mean, apologies if this sounds uh, just too obvious, but um, uh, I, I've seen a lot of neglect over the years to systems. So, uh, so, so what does it mean to service a system? Sorry, it's a lot of text. Um, so like, you know, once a year, actually set out, set out some time once a year to, to go to those systems that you're, you haven't touched over the course of the year, or very, very little, and and give them a uh, you know a fresh clean of life and a you know clean bill of health. Hopefully, so make sure that their dependencies are up to date. Go and get the latest uh, Java, sorry Java, the latest JSON uh, library that you're using. Make sure you bump it up to the latest, and uh, um, you know your, your your database drivers or connection, whatever it is. You, it makes whatever those dependencies are. Make sure they're um, make up to date, and you've got the freshest uh, dependency there. Uh, you know, check the logs and alerts of the system. I mean, uh, you know, often you visit a system after a while and, and the, the logs are just spewing out exceptions and you've never, never known they were happening or, you know, you, you may not have metric alarms that are, are triggering from these ex exceptions. So, uh, you know, try and clean that up. Make sure that the system is, is, is running clean. And, you know, test the, test the alarms as well. Like, watch the thing fail. Uh, watch the alarm fail and make sure the alarm is still valid. Um, 
you know, one day you might get bitten by the fact that that alarm didn't sound when you needed it to. Um, and well, yeah, ensure it's in keeping with the current standards. I mean, like as teams and companies, as we progress, we our standards change. We we have uh, we swap between libraries and frameworks, and um, you know, make sure we, we you keep it fresh with whatever the team's currently doing. Uh, you know, if it's using Scala test and everything else is now in Specs two, make sure you bring the the outlier that's using Scala test. Make sure you bring that up to Specs two or the other way around, whatever you uh, whatever you're using. Um, and and like. To put it on the Kanban board, put it on your board. Like the, the, this, this is um, this is something that I, I have been practicing to some extent, but I want to do more. Is like once a year, um, we talk about tech debt. We talk about oh, the system's you know, littered with tech debt, but um, um, but I think we need sort of different definitions of what types of tech debt we have. And and one one type of tech debt that I see commonly is just lack of maintenance. I feel. Um, so put it on the board. Uh, this is not a very good ticket, actually. Um, but like I would say, as a, as an engineer, I need to upgrade my JSON library to keep it in sync to, with other, or so that I can continue to maintain the project over the years. Or I need to switch the tests over to Specs 2 so that I can maintain the tests next year. Um, and when I've been practicing, well, I'm doing a lot of this servicing. When I've been doing it, I've tended to do it at Christmas time, and this probably varies depending on your industry. <laughs> But like, we, we don't have, you know, come middle of December, we don't have a lot of pressure at, at Shazam to get, hopefully this year, don't, uh, we, don't, we don't have, generally have a lot of pressure to get uh, features out the door. We have, you know, uh, the, the App Store has a freeze, doesn't it, I think, over Christmas. And uh, we have a deployment freeze at our back ends unless, unless it's an emergency. Um, so, you know, like, you know, write, write, write your, your Christmas list now, get those tickets on the board. And like, I mean, I've, I've I have a great example here where I, um, I was maintaining a system for a year or two. I left, left the company and sort of the Christmas, six months before I left, uh, I, I brought the system up to the, the current standards of what the company was, was running. So I switched out the, the REST framework we were using to the one we're all now using. And uh, I uh, up upgraded everything, brought, got it to a point where it looked nice and clean, um, updated the README, you know. Um, and I learned like two years on that that system was still running in, within that company. And the guy that maintained it picked it up after me, who was a new engineer at the company, he picked it up and ran with it and he extended it and made it, made it even better. So, um, but I think if I hadn't done that maintenance, I think he would have taken one look at it and, and, uh, and decided to bin it and start again. So I, I think it makes a difference. Um, I don't know how much of a difference, but I think that there's some examples there. Um, I'm probably running close to out of time. Um, I, uh, idea is be like open source. I think this is, this is probably true for well beyond the, the, just the scope of this talk, but we should all take follow the lead from, from some of the great things going on that have been going on for years in open source. Um, I, won't, I won't talk too much about that, but the, the, this is my, my final slide actually is, um, and again, this is probably beyond the scope of this talk really, but, um, but it became relevant just uh, a couple of weeks ago when, um, uh, so I was asked to replace the database of one of our running production systems. We wanted to swap from database A to database B. Um, and uh, that would normally be quite a tricky operation. Um, and, uh, I imagine, and I imagine, well, I've done, done it before, but oftentimes the tests can hinder you from making these dramatic changes to the, the code base. And that's, and that's because your tests are probably highly coupled to your production code. So you can't swap out a database without changing all the tests which are coupled to, to, to production code. So this, is, this idea is kicking around, I'm sure, for, uh, all around the industry. but. Um, but the, the system that I had to swap the database with, I, you know, it, uh, the, it, all of its tests were at the end-to-end -end acceptance level, whatever you want to call it, where they, they, they were high-level tests testing the public interface of the service. Um, and I didn't change any of the tests. They all just stayed as they were. And uh, you know, I swapped out the database to, to database B, and it went into production. And there was uh, no downtime, no, no one pulled any hair. And I told our site reliability guys, oh, by the way, I've deployed it, and it's running. And there was just n no fires at all. So um, but yeah, so, so anyway, I don't know why the slide's on this talk, really. But, but anyway, it's, it it's, um, <coughs> certainly aids maintenance, I guess, is, is, is my point, um, if, you, if you're testing uh, at that higher level. Um, I think I'm done.